You may be seated, and then take your Bible as I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 15 tonight. Last uh, week we looked at John 14 to try to answer the question, where's Jesus? And we found out that uh, uh, he's in heaven. He's on the throne, in fact, in heaven, but that uh, he's represented by the Holy Spirit who is nowhere else but in the believer. He's indwelling us. He is the Spirit of Christ. Chapter 15 follows uh, the 14th chapter, obviously, and I wanted to remind you that chapter 13 through 17 are part of, really, the preparation for Passover, which is interesting that we're looking at this passage tonight as uh, this is the week of uh, the Passover celebration uh, that we are in right now. At the conclusion of the Passover meal, they left, Jesus and his disciples left that upper room and they were on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And obviously, on the way to that garden, they passed by vineyards. And I think that in doing so, it, prevent, it presented our Savior a perfect opportunity to picture what the abiding Christian life is, what the abiding life of the believer is like, what the abundant life that he talked about in the 10th chapter of this same gospel is. The abundant life, the abiding life, they're the same thing. They're synonyms for the same life. It's the Christian life as Jesus intends it to be lived. And so I've had you turn to the 15th chapter, and uh, I'm going to begin uh, by turning your attention uh, to the first five verses, but in particular as we begin to verse 5, where Jesus says this, I am the vine. In verse 1 he says, I'm the true vine. There's also false vines, right? Mm -hmm. He's the true vine. He's the true vine, he said. You're the branches. He says, you, you that abide in me, and I in you, the same bringeth forth, notice this, much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. Well, let's pause there a moment, and then let's look at uh, some things that Jesus wants to communicate to our hearts tonight about the abiding life. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here tonight, and we thank you even more so that no matter where we are, you are abiding in us. And Lord, would you teach us tonight what it means to abide in you? And even more than that, that we would apply what you teach us and that we would abide in Christ, abide in Jesus, our Messiah. We thank you for this teaching and for what uh, you're going to accomplish in us as individuals as we give heed and as we let you have your way in Jesus name amen so I called your attention to verse 5 of John 15 notice several things here in the picture of a vineyard Jesus says I'm the vine he says believers are the branches on the vine. There is the stock, the vine, and the branches off of the... He's the stock, he's the vine, and believers are the branches connected to that stock, to that vine. And it's implied here, it's not said, but there is, there is life that flows from that vine, from that stock, into the branches. We call it sap, right? There is life that flows from the vine into the branches, and that sap, if I could put it that way, implied here is the Holy Spirit. Because he says in that fifth verse that he that abideth in me and I in him, Jesus abiding in us does so through the person of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Messiah, the Spirit of Christ, right? And so... He's the vine, Jesus, 
If you're a believer, you're the branches, and the sap is the Holy Spirit, and he passes from the vine through into the branches. And then notice this. That produces fruit. Now, what's the fruit? Now, some people think that the fruit is what Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. I don't think that's what it is referring to here. In John 15, I think it's very clear to me that the fruit is not that spiritual fruit, the nine fruits mentioned in Galatians 5, but rather the fruit that is produced in John 15, this spiritual fruit, are people that are saved through the branches witness. People that are saved through a believer's witness. Now notice who the gardener is. Verse 1, Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the husbandman or the gardener or the vine dresser. The father is the one that manages the believer's spiritual life in order to make it fruitful. That's his responsibility. But I want you to note something in verse 4 about bearing fruit. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, except it's connected to the vine, the branch can't bear any fruit. He says, no more can you, except you abide in me, Christ, Jesus, the vine, the true vine, and you the branch. So fruit bearing, very clearly, the believer has to stay vitally connected. It's called abiding here. Has to stay vitally connected. The branch on its own can't bear grapes. It has to stay attached. Now I want to say something about this, and I want you to get this and never forget it. This 15th chapter has caused a lot of believers to doubt their salvation. But listen to me, and listen to me carefully. John 15 has nothing to do with salvation. John 15 is not about salvation. It is about serving the Lord. It's fruit bearing. That's ministry for the Lord. Okay? So if you get that clearly in your thinking then you won't be thrown off by verses 6 and 7. Look at verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Contrast verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Talking about fruit bearing here. And uh, remember this, salvation is permanent. If you're saved, you are saved permanently. You're saved eternally. I think it's called eternal life, right? Not temporary life, it's eternal life. So salvation is permanent, but fruit bearing isn't. Fruit bearing is conditional, that's what he's saying here. and. Let's face it, if the branch represents believers, I know in my own life, and you know in your life, and you know in other believers' lives that are branches, you know that branches sometimes resist God's effort to make them fruitful. Paul feared that in his own ministry. And he said, I'm very careful about giving in to my fleshly appetites, my bodily wants. I don't let my bodily needs dictate to me because I don't want to be under its power. I want my body to be under my power. And that meaning the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, lest by any means while I preach to others, I myself be a castaway. And I think a castaway, and what is pictured in verse 6, 
are the same thing. And that is, you can be a believer and yet not bear fruit. And when you resist the efforts of God to make you fruitful, who is the gardener, he sets you on the shelf, so to speak. <laughs> and you become really useless to him as far as fruit bearing is concerned if you struggle against what he's trying to do in your life. But on the other hand, as it says in verse 7, in contrast to that, while people that resist, stubbornly resist the, uh, the Lord's efforts to make them fruitful, they're put on the shelf. And by the way, that's pretty, that, that can be evidenced in believers that lose interest in the things of the Lord. And they quit the fellowship of God's people. But in verse 7, it says people that allow the Father to develop fruitfulness in them, they have effective, miraculous answers to prayer. They have victory over the weakness in their life, their spiritual life. And the Word of God saturates their life, and as a result, they have biblical insight, and they have an inexplicable peace and they successfully win others to the Lord Jesus. I want to share with you three, three things from John 15 that I see here as definitive of the abiding life. Abiding is a life, first of all, of fruitfulness. That's obvious based upon what we've already said. Abiding is a life of fruitfulness. Look at verse 8 in this 15th chapter. Herein is my Father glorified that she bear much fruit. Look at verse 16. You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name... He'll give it you. Fruitfulness. That's the goal of the believing life. Not merely to be faithful. That's good. But to be fruitful. Don't ever, don't ever settle for mere faithfulness as a Christian. Make sure that you settle for nothing less than fruitfulness as a Christian. Because that's what glorifies God, and that's what he designs. That's his goal for every Christian life. And we sell ourselves short if we say, well, you know, I'm just going to be faithful. No. Determine that you're going to glorify God with fruitfulness, because that's his goal for you. It's to reproduce yourselves. Fruitfulness. Notice in that, 15, that 16th verse, the word go. That connects this fruitfulness with the Great Commission. It's you taking the initiative to witness. And there are two basic, two basic requirements for fruitfulness. Are you ready for these? Very simple, but vital. The first one is obedience. The first one is obedience. And I want you to look at verse 10 through 12. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I keep my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Obedience. The abiding life is a commitment to total submission or surrender. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. The believing life, though it has rules and standards, is not just about keeping rules. But rather, obedience is motivated by, a, by the love of God. Obedience is motivated by your love for him that flows out of your understanding of his great love for you. Obedience. But I want to quickly follow that up with this. 
Look at the last part of verse 5 of John 15. He says, For without me ye can do nothing. Zero. Obedience is a requirement for fruitfulness. It's part of the abiding life. It happens by obedience, but notice this. Without me, you can do nothing. That says that it is impossible to live a totally surrendered life without supernatural enablement. That absolute surrender is through a total dependence for the ability to be successful in your obedience. That make sense? It's a 0% slash 100% proposition. What, what do I mean? I mean this. It is 0% your will and your power. It is 100% God that gives you the desire, the will. It is God that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So the obedience, even the desire, comes from God, and then the power that comes from dependence upon God. Obedience and dependence, the two requirements of the abiding life that produces fruitfulness in your life. And that happens when you simply, before the Lord, confess your specific inability. You know, you know areas of your inability, you know areas where you always fall and fail, right? Well, perhaps when you begin your day, you should begin the day by saying, now, Lord, I want this to be a fruitful day. But I know that I'm going to fail in this one area or, this, or in these areas unless you help me, unless you, uh, you undertake for me and specifically confess your inability to the Lord and tell him that without his help you're going to fail and, uh, and tell the Lord that you're going to continually depend upon him and claim his supernatural help today. And see what a difference that makes in your life. See how fruitful your life becomes tomorrow when you practice that. So the abiding life is a life of fruitfulness that requires obedience and dependence, obedience by dependence, I should say. You trust to obey. And then the second thing that I see in this uh, 15th chapter, beginning in verse 13 and down through verse 17, as, is that the abiding life is not only a life of fruitfulness, but he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, I call you no more servants. I call you. I have. Uh, I call you friends. The abiding life is a life of fruitfulness. It's also a life of friendship. It's a life of friendship, according to these verses. It is the abiding life is a relationship that is based on love. That's what friendship is. And it's very important for us to see that what the Lord does in this passage is he connects all of his love and its effect upon us. First of all, friendship is really a partnership. And abiding is a loving partnership. It's based on God's love that he is about to express to his disciples when he hangs on that tree. It's about that love that he expresses to us as our sacrifice. It's a loving relationship that he draws us as close as possible to his heart in an intimate, loving fellowship that will result in us being prompted to love serving him and that will enable us for loving service. It's a partnership. Look at it, verse 9. As the Father have loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. It's a partnership. To be a partner with him. 
friendship. But also, it is a love that is perfected. You know what abiding is? It is a complete love. I want you to see it with me as we look at these verses. Verse 9, As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy might remain in you, that, you, that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now look at, the, the, look at how love is perfected here. This is friendship. This is what the abiding life is. It's a complete love. The Father loves Jesus. See that in verse 9? And Jesus responds with absolute surrender to the Father's love. And then Jesus says, I love you. And then you respond to him by total submission to his words, his will. And you love the brethren. And then God's love is passed along to them and then it becomes your brethren's responsibility to submit to others' interests and others' needs. And that is the completion of love or love perfected. It's all in this friendship motif here of the abiding life. So, the abiding life is fruitfulness. It's also friendship but it's about fulfillment and I want you to see something else here go back uh, drop down with me for a moment to verse 18 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you look at verse uh, 20 remember the word that I said unto you the servant is not greater than his Lord if they have persecuted me they will also persecute you they kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. Verse 21, but all these things they do unto you for my name's sake, because you, uh, they know not him that sent me. He says uh, in verse 22, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not sinned, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. What I want you to see this is this, that uh, he says that as a result of persecution, that first of all he suffered, God's word is fulfilled. And he predicts, he prophesies that we as believers are going to be persecuted as his followers too. So the abiding life, it brings fulfillment not only because of the benefits that it supplies us, such as miraculous answers to prayer, spiritual victory in our lives, and biblical insight, and the Messiah's joy and inexplicable peace. But here's something I don't want you to miss. The abiding life brings fulfillment also through suffering persecution for Jesus. We fill up the sufferings of Christ. We carry on where he left off. We're his body. We continue to suffer. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Verses uh, 25. Look at verse 25. But this cometh to pass that the, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in that their law, they hated me without a cause. That's quote from Two separate passages in the Psalms, Psalm 35, Psalm 69. And so it's a fulfillment, first of all, of prophecy, but also it's a fulfillment of the abiding life because persecution brings efficacy. You know what I mean by that? I mean suffering persecution for the Lord leads us to be effective witnesses. Now how? Well, let me share a couple of, of thoughts with you about that. First of all, suffering persecution for the Lord will provide a platform for unique opportunities to witness. 
by persecution, Paul had the opportunity to give the gospel to this elite praetorium guard in Rome. Open the door to witness to people he would have never. It gave him opportunity to witness to governors and high officials through persecution. So it's fulfillment, really. It's the fulfillment of the abiding life. In, in uh, chapter 1 of Philippians, the 29th verse, Paul says something to this effect. It's not only your privilege to be saved, but it's also your privilege to suffer for the Lord. And that's why when they were, when they were persecuted in Acts chapter 5, they left the temple and the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the Lord. It's a fulfillment of the abiding life. It brings efficacy. It provides a platform for unique opportunities to witness. And I'll tell you something else it does that makes it efficacious. It provides purity for credible witnessing. Have you ever caught the thought in that uh, first uh, verse of 1 Peter chapter 4? Basically, it says this in paraphrase, that the believer that suffers stops sinning. The believer that suffers persecution for Jesus ceases to sin, stops sinning. You know what? Pain has a unique way of rearranging our priorities. Pain has a way of showing us what really matters in life. And what pain reveals is that possessions are worthless. People that are in hospice care could care less about possessions. But what is important is the Messiah, Jesus, and uh, his things because they last forever. He says in this 15th chapter and the second verse, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The persecution is the purging for fruitfulness that brings about fulfillment of the abiding life. I don't remember who he was, but I remember a, an itinerant preacher that was staying at, uh, at some large uh, uh, farmer's uh, place in California. And it happened to be a believer in the church that was providing accommodations, hospitality, and he had large vineyards. And this preacher said, he showed me the vineyards, and he said, I was amazed because I was there at a time of year when those vines were cut down to the ground where there were hardly any anything to notice. It looked like there was nothing left and they were all dead. But he said later on, when I had opportunity to return, I saw the benefit of having cut back those vines as if they would never produce again. They were, they were full of fruit. Fulfillment. The fulfillment of fruitfulness. This is what the abiding life is. It's fruitfulness. It is fulfillment as we see here. And it is a friendship with the Lord. And all turns on those two things. Obedience to the Lord, but not in your strength. Obedience based upon dependence. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you might use these thoughts and may it provoke us perhaps to go back over chapter 15 on our own with maybe a better understanding, a little more insight, and as we sincerely desire to know the truth and uh, more importantly to apply it to our personal lives, you will open our eyes even more. And so Lord, I just pray that this would uh, spark an interest and whet the spiritual appetite to be fruitful believers, friends of yours, 
uh, people that know the fulfillment that is brought out in the abiding life, that abundant life that you promised to every single one of us, not just an elite class, but to every Christian who wants it, and we should want it. And we want to, you to cause us to want it, stir up our want tonight, and then open our eyes in Jesus' name. Amen.